Okay. Yeah, we are recording. Hello, the, I am Maria Bustela. I am the coordinator of the Supera project. And I'm going to give the, the floor uh, to Lut Meger from uh, Yellow Window, also partner uh, in the Supera Consortium. And she will act as a moderator. So uh, please, uh, Lut, whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Welcome everybody to our online event today of Supera on how COVID-19 has impacted on gender equality in research and academia. We will have three speakers today from our partner institutions who will share with you the results of surveys that they did within their organizations on how COVID impacted on work-life balance and academic time use in their organizations. But before we move to the program of today, I would like to share some practicalities with you. First of all, as Maria already said, this session is recorded. So please, if you don't want this, your, your um, image to appear on screen, you can shut off your cameras because the recording will also be published on the Supera channels and on the Supera website. I would like to ask you also to keep your microphone muted at all times during the session. Um, at the end of the session, there will be a QA and a um, short time slot. So during the presentations of the speakers, you can type your questions in the chat box that you can find on the bottom of your screen. And then in the end, we will try to address all the questions in the Q&A session. The speakers of today have 10 minutes time for their presentations. So I would like to ask all during the presentations to shut off the cameras and I will also shut off mine. The speakers will keep on their cameras and one minute before the end of their speaking time, I will switch on my camera again for them to know that they, their time is nearly up. So this will be a sign for them to wrap up their presentation. If they don't notice, I will have to brutally interrupt them, unfortunately. So I think this is it for uh, my practicalities. Um, let's move to our first speaker, who is one of our international advisory board members, who will do the introductions of the presentations. Jörg Müller, welcome to be with, welcome with us today. Jörg Müller is a senior researcher at the Internet Interdisciplinary Institute at the Open University of Catalonia in Barcelona. He holds a PhD in communications from the European Graduate School in Switzerland and also a degree in sociology and computer science from the Free University in Berlin. He has been involved in several European projects on gender and science and currently he's the coordinator of the H 2020 ACT project on communities of practice for accelerating gender equality in ins and institutional change in research and innovation across Europe. Jörg, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lut, and also thank you, Maria, for, for having me here and uh, sharing some reflections on, on the surveys and the presentations that are forthcoming. Um, yeah, I have 10 minutes. I have to start my clock. <laughs> um, I think the first thing that really I want to do is really congratulate uh, all of the three organizations and the people involved for carrying out uh, those surveys. I think they're really excellent quality and uh, given probably the additional burden that this is implied is really, you know, uh, a really an excellent effort. And overall, I think they are quite in line with what we know also from other research um, that has been published on a negative impact on the pandemic, especially on women academics. Um, for example, the, the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, report that has been published in 2021, um, you know, they all agree on that the higher caregiving responsibilities uh, of women at home, but also inside of uh, the academic institutions has a negative impact because in terms of, you know, the time they have available for their, for their scientific productivity, doing research, getting papers published. 
but it also has a negative impact in terms of the isolation of an experience. You know, working from home, you lose normal contact to your colleagues, to your sponsors, and um, this all affects also mental health. And I think the overall findings of uh, the different surveys confirm this, what, what we really know. I think it's also interesting to see that, you know, many responses that have been taken um, to, to a front the pandemic uh, had gendered implications people didn't think about uh, at the beginning. So one of this was the uh, stopping of the tenure clock, which said, okay, let's give everybody an out time. But actually the impact of this is quite different if you think about men and women in terms of, you know, access or losing uh, their access to funding. Or then also, you know, you might get an additional time for finishing your project, but this doesn't imply that you have additional funds and resources to do so. So it's just, you know, it's tense a little bit, the agony. Um, so I think what we see is that the existing inequalities that we've known from before the pandemic has been, you know, exacerbated, they become worse. And in one, in the words of one publication, you know, the, the existing fault lines crack into gaping chasms. So it's been really, um, uh, I think this is quite um, consistent. But we should also note that this adds to the overall picture. You know, we're talking about uh, gender equality inside the academia, but of course we also know that the impact has been much on a much broader level uh, in terms of also uh, domestic violence, which has affected uh, women and young girls uh, really strongly or in terms of, you know, the, the frontline health workers that have a front of the pandemic, you know, many nurses and, and doctors are women and who's been really uh, at the front line. So overall, what I want to do in uh, just offer two brief reflections. One is in terms of uh, the concerted efforts to monitor the impact of COVID, I think along the lines, what you've done really and then I think I want to also offer a reflection in relation to the academic, academic culture and what the pandemic and the work you've done might mean for, well, what's coming next, you know, the post-pandemic uh, environment that we're going to work, come back to. So let me start with the, with the importance of the monitoring. I think it's quite clearly, you know, um, I mean, there's no doubt that this is really important, the, the gathering of data and the, the monitoring, because it shows what we know, you know, existing inequalities really get worse. Um, but I also would like to invite everybody to think about this a little bit more systematic and convert often these isolated cases of monitoring into something a little bit more uh, concerted and uh, collaborative. So where we can build up on what we've done, what others have done really. So I think looking at other structural change projects, past and present, uh, besides Supera, I think what strikes me, what has struck me in the past, and, and again now is a little bit that, you know, many of those surveys on the working conditions and experiences, I mean, they're basically developed from scratch. So, which implies that, you know, many wheels have been reinvented over the course of these projects which also quite different outcomes in terms of the quality of the generated data. So I think I really admire the energy and the effort that went into the development of these efforts. But at the same time, it strikes me that there seems to be like three different surveys uh, that have been implemented. At least this is the impression that I got when looking at the PowerPoint presentations. So, in, so for the University of Cagliari, for example, you know, it was quite specific in terms of the measurement scales they used, whereas in the other ones, I think the questions probably have been slightly different. And I think this is understandable on the one hand, uh, because, you know, there's a specificity of the context and the context of these organizations are quite different. But at the, at the same time, I think the issues we are talking about in terms of care responsibilities, academic workloads, and so on and so forth, they're quite the same. So it would be nice to have a certain overlap of the instruments in order to be also able to talk about the commonalities and differences that exist uh, when we talk about these issues. Um, 
and I'm also saying this because of my own background in the ACT project where we developed the gender equality audit and monitoring tool, which I think goes a little bit in this direction because it offers uh, a standardized way of uh, assessing this data and, and gathering data, especially also, and this is the other thing that I was missing a little bit, is in terms of the intersectionality. Uh, the University of Calgary has in their models the age as a variable, but others not necessarily. So I think if we could work together more along these lines and use, for example, the measurement instruments that we've developed in the act to look at these intersectional dimension of gender, sexual orientation, transgender status, health impairments, socioeconomic status, ethnic minority minority, I think this would be uh, consume less time and be the much richer, I think, also. The second aspect, I think, is about the things of academic culture and the future of work. So I think the general feeling was that the world has stopped during the pandemic, but we work more than ever. So every, everything comes to a halt and we continue to work like uh, crazy. I mean, on the one hand, we are, of course, fortunate that we could work because many didn't have this opportunity. They really, you know, lost their income. But I think it's also what I miss a little bit is the opportunity to really reconsider what is important, uh, reorient our values, maybe. Because it seems it's very depressing what this implies for the, the work after uh, the pandemic has end because now it seems like it's really we are we've been pushed further down the hole of very precarious academic work and it's especially for women so I think it would be nice to have this opportunity to think about the change and how we want to change the academic culture uh, instead of becoming it you know more hyper competitive and a very monocratic un understanding of scientific uh, excellence um, that really just led to a more self-optimization of ourselves, but not really uh, affronting uh, this whole response to how we imagine the work after the pandemic in a more collective way, really. So I think in this, along these lines, it's also worth a reflection, you know, we're sitting all at home now. <laughs> so how can we talk about or discuss or formulate a collective response to what we see this you know exacerbated inequalities while being cut off on the one hand it's very nice you know to connect easily without all the travel but on the same time it's also about you know a sense of isolation a loss of contact with your colleagues which uh, i personally really miss a lot you know this normal usual interaction but which is not there anymore yes i'm looking at my time yeah thank you so i think you know we should think about and, and and the presentations are an opportunity i think to really reflect upon you know what needs to be changed not only in terms of gender equality but overall of the academic culture and that we work uh, with and through this uh, pandemic so and i think i hope we have a fruitful discussion on that thank you very much Thank you, Jörg, for your reflections. So you've also made us curious. So let's move to the first presentation, which will be made by Monica Lopez. Monica is a researcher at the... Sorry, now it's my... I don't manage, to... yeah, okay. Is a researcher at the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra. She holds a PhD in sociology and her work focuses on gender policies and the way gender relations are expressed, particularly in the fields of work, employment and organizations. And currently, among other responsibilities, Monica leads the Portuguese team of Supera. Monica, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lut. Good afternoon. I am pleased to be here sharing the main results of the survey carried out at the University of Coimbra and thus contributing to the discussion on the gendered and gendering nature of COVID-19's impacts on labor market, on the academic labor. Uh, in this presentation, we draw from the results 
have the survey conducted in the University of Coimbra to explore how and to what extent gender inequalities are shaping the impact of the pandemic on the academic working conditions, time and performance. Um, that uh, were collected from an online questionnaire sent by email to the universe of uh, teaching and research staff of the university. A total of 2,081 questionnaires were duly filled and returned, corresponding to a response rate of 40%. Um, the characteristics of the respondent sample in terms of gender, academic ranks and scientific areas are broadly in line with those of the overall academic population of the institution, although we should signal the overrepresentation of women in the sample. That uh, was processed and analyzed using uh, SPSCS and a range of statistical analyses were conducted, frequency and contingency analysis, association and correlation, as well as linear and categor categorical regressions, ordinal and uh, binomial. We tried to apply an intersectional lens to uncover connections with some other axes of inequality, such as family circumstances, age, and tenure status. All this of the survey results presented here as differing, as differing over gender, uh, age, with children up to 12, and type of contract are statistically significant. Um, we were firstly interested in exploring the gender impacts of COVID-19 in terms of working conditions and found that access to some of essential resources is not uniform, being influenced by sex, children, age and tenure status. Men report greater accessibility to most listed resources, although only the access to good internet connection is statistically uh, significant. Uh, moreover, maternity appears to be an important factor in bringing the access of women to all listed resources, uh, while for men, parenting only plays a significant role on access to a calm environment. Uh, age and employment state status also influence access to remote working conditions. Uh, home working spaces and quiet environments are less accessible to younger ages and to people with uh, precarious contracts. And when we intercept these variables with gender, we observe that younger uh, male academics do not experience the, relati the relative disadvantage younger females face on access to proper, to proper housing conditions and the environment for uh, remote work. We also found that the psychological impact of the pandemic is particularly perverse for women we reported higher levels of sadness, anxiety, health concerns, and worries about their professional future, as well as perceived lack of control. Parenthood was also a, signif a significant factor, with uh, academics with young children being uh, particularly uh, apprehensive, which is an indicator of the special vulnerability of people with children to the uncertainty associated with the pandemic. Um, considering the intersection of professional status, we found that exposure to uncertainty regarding professional future experiences by female academics and those with children is shared by younger respondents and those with precarious contracts, which is accompanied by feelings of stress and anxiety, which parenthood seems to amort amortize. As regards to personal and household tasks, in line with the previous studies, our findings indicate that the pandemic has disproportionately affected not only the exposure to domestic and care work of women, but also the personal routines of female academics during the lockdown compared with uh, their male counterparts. Younger uh, academics with children were also particularly affected. Um, the increased households and the emotional burdens arising from COVID restriction have effects on the, the work-life um, negotiations and conflicts, 
uh, posing differenti differentiated or challenges to reconcile the competing time demands of paid work and family. And our results indicate that female academics and academics with young children, children are um, relative, relatively more exposed to work-life balance struggles affecting both professional routines and domestic duties, notably as a result of accumulation of tasks and difficult, difficulty in performing them. Uh, female academics and uh, academics with young children are also uh, those who most emphasize the influence of COVID-19 on the amount of time dedicated to professional work, 68% of women and 67% of people with children up to, up to 12 declare that COVID-19 has a moderate or large influence compared to 54% of men and 48% of academics without children who declares um, this influence. Um, from the observation of the graph on the average change in weekly hours dedicated to uh, the different areas of academic work before and during confinement, confinement <clears throat> we can see that most pronounced adjustments are those by academic staff with children in uh, the research and knowledge, knowledge transfer areas with a reduction of around 34 and 63 percent in time dedication, respectively. Uh, along gender lines, we can observe that women were particularly bound to the reinforcement of teaching and the institutional service, which include the so-called academic housekeeping during uh, the pandemic. We also explore the impacts of the pandemic in academic production. And our results provide mixed evidence that the pandemic has disproportionately affect, affected the academic product, product, productivity of female academics during the lockdown compared with their male counterparts. Because when solo, and solely considered, neither gender nor parenthood had a significant effect on the changes in uh, academic uh, product, production. Uh, however, when, we, when combined gender and family status significantly influence scientific outputs, placing women scientists with uh, young children in particular disadvantage uh, when compared to women without children and men with and without children. Um, the decrease in academic output is even more pronounced among, among those who are precariously employed. Considering that uh, academic outputs, particularly publication, are currently key criteria of merit underpinning uh, career progression, this might translate into increased inequalities in career progression uh, between uh, different groups of scholars, namely between mothers and childless uh, scholars and men, and between scholars in permanent and non-permanent uh, jobs. In conclusion, uh, the findings highlight uh, not only the greater severity of the effects of the pandemic crisis and on academic women, but also the particular disadvantage of junior academics with young children or in precarious work arrangements to respond to the strong demands and high standards of academic uh, performance even during the pandemic. Our results also indicate, um, are also indicative of the importance of institutional support to reduce the negative impact of the pandemic, including support from colleagues, from administration uh, services, from department or university <laughs> leadership. And this support was found to be critical in multiple aspects, namely in the mitigation of negative effects on uh, academic performance during the confinement. Uh, this research points to the necessity of academic institutions as well as funding organi organizations to take into consideration these disproportionate uh, effects uh, in particular groups of academics uh, by putting in place policies and measures to mitigate inequalities. As I overrun my allotted time, I will stop uh, here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Very punctual. Our next speaker is um, Barbara Barbieri. She's associate professor at the Department of Political and Social Sciences of the University of Cagliari. 
and her main research interests concern the issues of organizational well-being, the psychological and gender implications in entrepreneurship, the intellectual capital management in organizations. Mm. She's a psychologist and a member of the Supera Unica core team. Barbara, your turn. Thank you very much, Lut, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Okay, this is the title uh, we have chosen uh, to present uh, our work, uh, Work Family Interface, uh, Stress uh, and Academic Productivity During the COVID-19 Health Emergency. I'm about to present part of the findings that emerged from the survey conducted in uh, the University of Calgary, specifically the part relating uh, to the psychological dimension and their possible influence on the academic productivity during the pandemic. When we thought about which psychological variables to include without burdening the survey, which was already long, we took into consideration what had already been suggested in the literature already before the pandemic, namely that gender and parenthood are associated with scientific productivity and more specifically to female scientific productivity in uh, academia. Several studies on this issue conduct uh, uh, over the past year have uh, highlighted that the coronavirus pandemic is altering or have already altered dynamics in academia and uh, that people are jungling remote work and domestic demands, including child childcare, for example, have felt impacts on their productivity. So uh, we included some scales in uh, our survey that uh, would allow us uh, to explore whether certain uh, psychological dimensions could contribute to explaining scientific productivity, satisfaction with scientific productivity and stress during the pandemic. In addition, we set out to explore the role of work-family interface, both in terms of conflict and enrichment in influencing productivity, satisfaction, and of course, stress. Finally, we analyze the possible differences in the dimension mentioned above in relation to gender academic position and the presence or absence of children. This is our sample. The survey was administered between September and October 2020 with 243 answers. The response rate was approximately 25%, therefore quite low, but in line with the response and participation rate on research on the subject in other Italian university context. Also because uh, you can imagine how many questionnaires on the topic uh, have come to academics during, during this year. The sample is made up of men and women aged between 30 and 70 years old with following academic position, full professor, associate and researcher. 44% of respondents are childless, 27% uh, have one child, 22% two children, and 7% uh, three or more children. These uh, are the scale we use to measure psychological, psychological dimension. Perceived stress scale in the two dimension, positive and negative work family interface in the four dimension, work load, perceived organizational support, work engagement, work social isolation. Isolation from colleague, colleagues, sorry, isolation from company in our case, from a university, from academia. And these are the statistical methodology uh, we have used to analyze our data. Correlation to verify association between all dimensions, regression model in order to test the, <coughs> the role. Sorry, I need to, okay. 
uh, in order to um, uh, test the role of the different dimension of uh, the work family interface, uh, work load and perceived organizational support on positive and negative perceived stress, productivity and productivity satisfaction for regression we are conduct. We use as dependent variable, positive stress, negative stress, scientific productivity and satisfaction. Three models were significant. Instead, the regression model of the scientific productivity variable did not show significant results. Finally, we perform the multivariate analysis to determine if there were significant difference between gender, academic position, presence or absence of children, scientific productivity and productivity satisfaction. And we use age as a covariate. We, uh, we, I don't know. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, we don't have time to uh, discuss correlation also because we think uh, that uh, um, the regression model is uh, more interesting uh, and uh, I will make a general comment on uh, this three uh, regression. It can be said that the central dimension that contributes to explaining stress, both in positive and negative terms and satisfaction with scientific productivity is the positive spillover from work to family. A dimension that is significant in all three uh, model analyzed. This means that positive experience at work also in this pandemic situation, such as moods, skills, uh, values uh, and behaviors transferred to family domain act on stress in terms of straightening of strategies that allow to control the unpredictable aspect of life and to manage stress, also affecting, affecting satisfaction <clears throat> with productivity. Then according to work family enrichment theory, support and resources from one domain can enhance performance in the other domain through instrumental and affective path, for example, skills or emotions. On the contrary, the negative spillover affects negative stress in the work family direction and satisfaction with scientific productivity in the family work direction. What does it mean? According in this case uh, with uh, the role stress theory, the role pressures from the work and the family domains are mutually incompatible in some respect. That is participation in the work role is made more difficult by virtue of participation in the family role. More specifically, negative pressure at work to affect family produce stress and discomfort. While when family life interfere with work, this conflict uh, in a negative way affect job satisfaction. Okay, and in order to discuss uh, quickly. Barbara, you have, you have two minutes left. Okay, I'm going to uh, conclusion. So I can give some suggestion about the uh, multivariate analysis. Okay. Women feel more negative stress, uh, even though at the same time, they feel uh, more supported by uh, their, uh, or, or, uh, their own organization. Full professor and associate are those who perceive the most workload and perceive a conflict between the family and the work domain. So with the family that in a negative way interfere with work. Parents than non-parents experience more negative stress, but they feel more supported by the organization and experience more negative work to family and family to work spillover. People who are more satisfied 
with their scientific productivity than those less uh, experienced, more positive work to family and family to work spillover. Positive stress is more associated with positive work to family spillover. Negative stress is more associated with age and positive and negative work to family spillover. Satisfaction with scientific productivity is mostly associated with a positive work to family spillover. In conclusion, our results underline the role of the work family interface, both in terms of enrichment and conflict in influencing stress and satisfaction with productivity and suggested the importance of acting with work-life balance policies to prevent stress in academia and increase satisfaction in academia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Now we move to our last presentation, which will be made by Maria Bustelo. Maria is Associate Professor of, the political, of Political Science and Public Administration at the Complutense University in Madrid. And she's also the Director of the Master on Evaluation of Programs and Public Policies since 2002. Maria is the Supera Coordinator at the European level and she leads the Excellence UCM Research Group on Gender and Politics. Maria, your turn. Thank you very much, uh, Lut. I'm going to uh, show. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, thank you. Let me um, do this. Okay, so thank you very much, Lut. Um, I am presenting the, the, the third uh, survey conducted uh, at the UCM. And uh, actually it was the first one conducted uh, between June and July. So it was at the end of the very first uh, lockdown that in Spain was very strict. We are a very uh, big uh, university. So uh, our population of uh, research and academic staff is, is more than 6,000 uh, people. And uh, as the others, it was through uh, an online uh, questionnaire, in this case distributed through the, um, through the faculties and the, and the different deans with the help of the Gender Equality Node Network, uh, which has been working as a gender, the Gender Equality Hub uh, uh, with, with Supra. Um, we we, we, we um, ask, of course, uh, the same as uh, the working conditions. And regarding the physical conditions, we asked uh, the same as in, in Coimbra for computer equipment, internet connection, and in an independent room for working and having an outside space. And we found significant differences in the those two you have there, having a good uh, computer equipment in favor of men, and uh, also an independent room of uh, his own in the case of, of male, really significant in the sense of the Virginia Woolf. Okay, um, regarding, uh, and this is uh, for, uh, of course, the same as in the other, for confirming not only this other service, but other uh, studies, um, as, as uh, Barbara was saying, is that regarding the psychological uh, aspects, uh, we found uh, significant differences in all the items. So really women claim uh, that they have been felt more, uh, they, that they have felt more sadness, preoccupation, anxiety and stress, feeling overwhelmed, and even losing uh, control, and they were significant in all the cases. Um, we uh, ask for time use uh, perception and, uh, and uh, of course, um, uh, the differences that exist in all the, the time use studies uh, regarding the domestic and care uh, use of time are confirmed. And as you can see there, because that's uh, I show the after the lockdown, we, we ask before and, and after. And um, the difference, I mean, we can see that they were a little bit uh, aggravated, especially with the uh, childcare. Uh, but also we had something that it was uh, a, a different, that is um, that uh, men spend more time on do the essential shopping. So they were the ones in the very restricted conditions, the ones going outside a uh, home. And of course, uh, more in shopping exercise, and sorry, in exercise uh, sports and, and leisure. So 
We also, and that's the, the big thing, we also ask about uh, time usage perception uh, regarding academic, academic uh, time. And um, we ask also before and after. And before the lockdown, women say they spend a slightly less time per week on academic work than men. And uh, during confinement, this data turn around and, and, and were made significant also. So they were not significant before. So really uh, women invested more time uh, on, on, uh, during, the, uh, during uh, the pandemic in academic uh, uh, work. We uh, also uh, ask not only about the general uh, uh, time usage, but also uh, di in different tasks. And, and this was really uh, very interesting because it really what confirmed is that gender roles uh, really work also in the academic uh, 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 work and in the economic uh, world for, for seeing uh, quickly, right? Uh, women uh, spend more time and more significantly on academic work during confinement, we, see, we saw that, with the presence of clear gender biases. So women spend uh, more time preparing classes and attending to students, and men in writing and publishing paper and articles. If you see, it is a striking, the change in the perception of dedication to writing and publishing before and during the pandemic, and uh, the huge gap between men and women. Of course, here we are showing the, 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 uh, the significant differences, um, and uh, there were also some other significant differences in some issues. For example, women spend more time applying for merit evaluation submissions and applications and uh, before confinement and participating in commissions and committees before and after uh, the, the confinement. So um, also uh, talking about the academic uh, performance and satisfaction at work, we see, we, we also asked uh, to what extent you agree with these statements related to your academic work uh, during the confinement. And as you can see, uh, women have worked more unusual hours, found it more difficult to work without interruptions, and have used work as a mechanism to distract themselves from the situation. I really find this very interesting, this last item. So the women really uh, were saying that concentrating and so doing the academic work really helped them uh, during the, the pandemic. But of course, what it is really interesting is that the item that was the opposite, and uh, this in this case uh, was uh, men, uh, men uh, significantly uh, take, took more advantage of the lockdown to catch up with academic work. So they they, they really felt probably more comfortable and, and, and more uh, productive. There were no significant differences uh, in having felt comfortable working at home. There were no differences in feeling efficient in teaching and management issues. And uh, we had also another item um, uh, work um, asking about uh, feeling productive during the lockdown. And this was only uh, in the agree and strongly agree option uh, in favor of men. So um, there was a, another item in which we asked, uh, we asked about a series of circumstances that may have affected their academic performance during the COVID-19 crisis. And women say that as you can see, the attention to their family, the number of hours uh, of housework and care, their emotional state catching up on online tools and the accumulation of tasks and the difficulty to attend them uh, significantly affected, affected their uh, uh, academic performance in comparison uh, to men. And uh, the last uh, uh, um, issue to see is how this whole academic performance is uh, reflected in academic productivity. And we, we ask uh, before the pandemic and after the pandemic, and before the pandemic, we ask for the whole year. So, so um, they have things that are not comparable, but we needed to do so. And, and of course, we confirm that um, it, we already, I mean, that men published significantly more book uh, chapters, articles, patents, and arti artistic and musical works during 2019. So there were already differences in academic uh, productivity for, uh, for the uh, UCM. 
And uh, what it is uh, important is to see uh, then this data after, uh, during the pandemic. And of course, we ask here uh, slightly different because we were thinking about working on in and send it to, to publishing. And um, these uh, differences, as you can see, were aggravated during the, the pandemic. And uh, for example, you can see, although aggravated, but also, I mean, it was the same uh, uh, differences. So um, for example, in peer review articles, you can see that the production, it was really uh, very productive for, for men, also productive for women, uh, but uh, really the difference was uh, really terrible from uh, one to the, to the other. And for example, as a curiosity, it was curious that we found a significant difference in sending to publish uh, popular uh, science articles, uh, dissemination uh, uh, science articles uh, uh, by men, and that, that's a curiosity. So uh, finally, um, the summary uh, in general is that um, in general, female faculty staff has experienced a much harder time during the lockdown than their male uh, colleagues. We have worse working conditions, increase both uh, domestic and caring and academic uh, time. Gender roles conf confirmed and aggravated during uh, uh, lockdown. And this has consequences in academic uh, performance. Um, the, uh, as, as, as Jörg uh, was saying, I think that the pandemic has left naked uh, the structural inequalities that were already there. And I think that's uh, uh, really important. So in that sense, these studies are helping us to make this reality uh, a little bit more visible. And that's how we are trying to work that in the, at the, at, in, from the supera and in the, concretely in the Complutense, we are trying to use this diagnosis to feed the new uh, uh, gender equality uh, plan that will be approved this uh, coming year in uh, UCM, this can, the coming academic year. And uh, of course, to work with uh, gender equality notes in the different uh, faculties. We have uh, already, and let me tell you that we have have done a report and fortunately is only in Spanish, but um, we have a, a, a big report that, that is there. I, I will ask uh, Paula and Lorena to, to put the, the, the link in the in the chat. And uh, precisely we have uh, called it in, in Spanish desigualdades al descubierto. So it's the idea of that this COVID-19 crisis are discovering uh, inequalities that were already there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, and thank you all speakers for the interesting presentations. We are also happy to have with us another member of our International Advisory Board, Nicole Heuge, and she will present us some reflections on the results of the survey. Nicole has an engineering degree from the University of Ghent in Belgium and a master's degree in applied statistics from the University of California at Berkeley, and she has more than 25 years of experience in turning customer data into strategic insights. She's the CEO and founder of Bubuk, an international consultancy company that is specialized in consumer analytics. Nicole, we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Lute. Um, I'd like to start with repeating what uh, York said um, at the start, is really congratulating um, the three speakers and everyone involved, because I'm sure there was a team behind uh, each one of you to, uh, to get this work done. I mean, this is, this is really wonderful. Um, seeing some numbers and some confirmation is so much more powerful than anecdotal evidence. I think like all of you said also, uh, Marie at the end and also York, I mean, we do know that there's gender inequality. I don't think we can really discuss that, but as long as you don't see figures, it's really difficult to make a case on that. So given that we live in a kind of a data-driven world, any numbers that we can present are really so useful. So, so really well done. Also the fact running a survey um, sounds, sounds much easier, kind of, you know, if you think about it, you might think, oh, I quickly put some questions online and I send them off doing a survey and really thinking through, you know, design, what do we want to ask, who do we ask it for, um, you know, it takes quite a bit of energy and you've all done that uh, really great. Uh, looking at the response rate, I know, Barbara, you, you said you were somewhat disappointed on the 14% um, 
response rate, I think for the other two universities, that's 25. Given the world that we live, where we are bombarded with all kinds of information um, or kind of things that are sent to us, these response rates are definitely not bad. You know, we, I know we were we are used to response rate of 40 or maybe 50%, not anymore. So I think the numbers you're getting there, you really you can be proud of what you got. Um, so that, that that's really great stuff. In terms of the insights, I mean, I, I, I won't really repeat what you've mentioned because I think it's extremely clear um, what, what we see there in terms of inequality and what's driving it. Um, I, I heard often the, the term significant uh, being mentioned, these differences are significant or, or those are not. Um, although I'm a statistician and love numbers, um, sometimes I kind of ignore the significance level because as soon as you see across everything that we've heard today, that trend is very clear. So even if it's not only significant or not all, uh, always significant, that's not a big issue. I mean, it's, it's more looking across of what we've learned and there the story is very clear, even if certain numbers are not necessarily significant. I, I wouldn't really worry about that. Even as an academic, I would say. Um, in terms of... Um, Possibly what, what could be done more with the um, excellent data you, you collected. Um, this is more with my consulting hat on. Uh, what we very often do is look at segments, segments of um, academia. Of course, we, we already segmented them in terms of gender, age, motherhood, and also if they are um, with a precar um, precarious contract. And, and this is gr really great stuff. But what you also could do is say, well, let's park that segmentation or the way we look at it at a site and um, start from the data and look at who are the most um, dissatisfied, most unhappy, most stressed um, academic to the kind of the most feeling comfortable. And what kind of groups or profiling do we see in each of that? Um, so look at almost at kind of from a different angle from, from what's done now. Most likely it will be similar, but it will give you a good idea of who are the, the most stressed or the least stressed and who's in that in bucket, in each of those buckets. What I was also thinking, and that's maybe a bit controversial, I know that um, women most often, you know, are in a worse position uh, than their male counterparts. There's no doubt about that. But I was thinking there's probably also a subset of females, or at least I would hope so, that feel less stressed, that feel, I would say, at ease, and trying to understand what are the characteristics of, of these females, what can we learn from it? Um, so not only looking at, you know, females are kind of at the worst part, which is, which is indeed the case, but is there a subset of females, possibly even mothers, that, you know, are doing okay? And, you know, is there something that we can learn that we can apply to the broader um, population of females? Um, so it's possibly something that can be looked at um, at the data we have now. In terms of the future, uh, moving forward with this, um, doing a survey is great because it gives you a snapshot view of what's going on today. Um, what makes it even more powerful if we can track it over time? I believe Jorgen made that point at the start as well. Uh, make it part of a process, uh, understanding that inequality day is, is really important, but it will become even better if we can look over time, is that getting better or there are certain points not being addressed, uh, what's being addressed, what's not addressed, how are people feeling in the future. So tracking what you've done uh, today um, will, will, will um, of course enforce that story and it will give you more um, insight in the future. Now, of course, if we think about tracking, um, as I've said at the start, doing this takes a lot of energy. So what, what is done uh, very often in the industry when surveys are done is to automate it or to get a process it's, that's easier to manage. So automation is a very big word. Uh, so have, have a mechanism. Uh, so sending out these surveys on a more regular basis, that doesn't mean every month, every six months might be sufficient, but do it in a way that, you know, it doesn't require too much energy. There's also no need to re-ask all the questions. I mean, the questions that we've seen were really great, well thought through, 
Um, but we can already see from the data that there's some correlation between some topics. So there's no need to re-ask all that say 20 or 30 questions, maybe a subset of five that gives us a very good impression of how, how things are moving on might be sufficient. So I, I'm more a believer of having more frequent surveys than having a few once in a while with, with more topics, because that will give you an idea if things are progressing or not. Coming back on the point that York said about streamlining um, the different uh, methodologies and processes in terms of what's asked, I'm also in favor of that. <clears throat> At the other hand, I think there's also a strength of the specificities of each um, survey or each university because then you can basically zoom into specific topics. You know, it will, I, th I think at the end of the day, give you a richer story because you're kind of putting a lens on it in different ways. So there's kind of, you know, pros and cons of saying, well, you know, we're going to streamline it across the universities or we're going to zoom in on something specific, each one of us, so we have a broader view altogether. Um, another element that might be worth considering for the future, especially if you would say, well, we're gonna rerun this more regularly, but with a shorter set of questions, you could say, well, this is not gonna take a lot of energy. We can do that pretty easily, but we gotta complement it with some more richer insights. And richer insights, I mean, this is very often done in the industry where I come from, is we say, well, we have a survey that sent out to a thousand people, for instance, but we complement it with some more in-depth interviews. So let's say you pick out five female um, academici, also males, um, and you have like an hour discussion with them on topics. Um, you won't be able to talk to a thousand, you probably only talk to five or 10, but you will get a lot more into depth in terms of, you know, what is the issue, what's bothering them, what would help them also to get ideas in terms of um, actions that might lead on to that. So that, well, we call that a qualitative angle. That could be helpful. Another angle to supplement the insights that we have from, from these studies is to look at what's being said in social media. So there are a lot of tools these days where you can scrape or analyze what are the topics, what are academics you talking about? Is, is the topics that are being talked about, is the sentiment, because you can also do sentiment analysis for social media, um, is a sentiment of female academics, is it different from uh, the male counterparts? So there are a lot of um, other tools or other data sources that can be used to complement the great work that has been done um, here. Um, maybe as a final note, um, I think this is great work. I, I really hope that this ends up in an action plan that Maria was uh, referring to. I think a great uh, survey is only as useful as the actions that come from it. Um, <laughs> so I really hope that the actions, you know, that step by step things will improve, and then when we, when you do track it, you rerun around the surveys that you'll see some improvement. Because I think that's what we're all aiming for. But thanks again for the great work. And thanks so much, Nicole, for your reflections. Very interesting and definitely um, promising in terms of um, further work that we can do and a lot of potential on uh, on next steps. Now it's time for um, a Q&A with the audience. So if people are willing to switch on their cameras again, feel free. We don't have that many questions in our chat. Some of the questions have already been engaged with by some of the speakers, but we have a question left. And I think that has remained unanswered by um, UCM. So maybe Maria, if you can elaborate on the basis of which um, time frame the uh, the measured activities uh, were based so was it on a daily basis was it on a weekly basis and if it was weekly was it monday to friday or really a calendar week what was the basis for your measurements maria thank you so much lud and that was uh, yeah a very good question and that's something i i didn't have the time to say but of course uh, we have to recognize that what we asked uh, was about perception of time usage that we know that is not um, that is a, a, a very subjective uh, estimation 
and uh, because it, there was no way to apply a concrete methodology for the for the time use that is very well elaborated and 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 it wasn't possible. I remember consulting uh, Nicole to say what we can do or or giving really a, a, a importance to that because it's really about perception of of time uh, usage. It's not about time usage. Um, and and uh, I, I remember Nicole saying, I mean, this is not so important. The importance is the differences in perception. So, but but of course, our perceptions and about the measurement, we ask all always on a weekly uh, base. Okay, uh, but of course, just uh, as an example for for telling you that's what happened at the UCM, we ask about how much time uh, each week you put into academic work, and and then people said an amount of time, and then uh, ask the different tasks. If you sum up the different tasks. It was much more time <laughs> devoted to uh, to the uh, weekly, and probably this is because of the estimation uh, um, uh, subjectivity. So, so it's on perception, but the perceptions are different. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Maria. There are also several of the people in our audience that are interested in parts of the survey and parts of the presentation. Um, everybody feel free to drop an email to the email address of uh, Supera. You can find it on the website of Supera, asking for specific um, parts of the presentation or parts of the report, and we will try to uh, respond to you individually. I have a question for the three speakers, in fact. So you did this huge exercise with these interesting, sometimes also shocking findings. Now, what I wonder is, have you found a listening ear amongst the leadership of your institutions and how have they reacted and has this led to any changes in institutional policies or what have been the consequences of these findings within your institution? So this is a question for the three of you, you but let me start maybe with uh, Monica. We cannot hear you, Monica. No, like we give Monica a bit of time to solve her technical problem and let's move to Barbara in the meantime. Thank you, Lut. Uh, yes, we have, uh, as you know, uh, we have a new rector uh you know, since uh, april and now we have uh, finally a delegate for gender uh, equality and uh, esther coy is, uh, is a colleague also in a uh, super core team from uh, Eureka. so uh, we conquest uh, uh, a leadership position with super project in uh, for uh, for gender equality yeah so but if i understand you correctly by now there have still not been changes in the policies no no okay no no, no. yes no. monica yes we hear you oh okay thank, thank you thank you Luke. sorry um as you know taking uh, into account our results uh, including the respondents uh, replies to an open-ended question in the survey, we have proposed a series of uh, mitigation uh, measures at the UC, which comprised uh, simplified administrative, uh, administrative procedures and reducing bureaucracy, e-teaching training, provision of resources to remote working, adaptation of uh, criteria for performance evaluation, work family um, balance uh, measures. Well. Um, we, meet, we met with a, a vice rector and uh, we, was to, we were told that those measures or some of those uh, recommendations were already in place. Uh, but um, to, be, to be realistic, we've, we haven't seen none of them uh, in, uh, in place. So um, I believe that uh, nothing specific was done uh, was then uh, yet on the the measures that we have proposed although 
more uh, more cross cutting measures as uh, e, e teaching training or 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 uh, provision of resources to remote working. We know that um, some of uh, uh, initiatives have been have uh, have been put in place, but more specific ones. Um, uh, um, namely those addressing uh, younger uh, younger academics with children up to 12 we know that nothing has uh, been uh, put in place so um, we have made a, an effort uh, in a given operational uh, given even uh, operationalization um, uh, tips uh, but uh, we don't have information that none of the more specific ones were being put in place. But Thank it's you. still possible, of course. Oh, of course. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Maria for UCM? Yeah. For UCM, I think it's uh, the, the same uh, as the other is that things go a little bit slow. Uh, and uh, even if these uh, results, we got them like in uh, last fall or something like that in, in the three universities, I think that the institutions are li a little bit slow in, in, in reacting. Uh, but of course, we, we find our, our ways. And, and in the case of the UCM, we have already worked on on uh, with a gender equality um, uh, node uh, network on working on which kind of mitigation measures. Uh, so we have had some workshops, and what we are trying to do is to feed the the, the gender equality plan at the rectoral level that uh, it's being worked now and negotiated with uh, with the different uh, people at the university. And uh, of course, wh what we are doing also is doing this um, work in the in the faculties you, you have to take into account that the UCM is a very big university so so really the the, the university life really happens on the, in in each uh, faculties we have 26 so that's uh, quite a big and and what we are doing is that we are having this uh, presentation of the results uh, by by scientific fields and, and, and we are uh, like uh, segregating the data for, for them to have a specific data. I also didn't tell you that uh, in the survey, we also um, got, we had some open questions uh, and we have very good uh, qualitative data there uh, that is also there. And, and this is something that we are also working uh, with, uh, with those uh, data at, at their faculty uh, level. And uh, of course, we are also trying to do this idea of not only you know, presenting results, but also doing these participatory workshops uh, with the people in the faculties to try to, um, among all of us, to try to think about possible mitigation measures. So we hope uh, that this will be, you know, it, it will be in the, in the future and in the near future, we will, we will get some from uh, out of it. Thank you. <laughs> and um, linking back to what uh, Nicole said, so this, this important effort has been done with resources of Supera. Now, do you think there is a possibility that it can be repeated or even become sustainable as a regular survey, even if smaller with a restricted number of questions in your institutions, even when the resources of Supera are not there anymore? Do you think that's a possibility? I, I think so, Lut. And uh, we have also other measures uh, similar to uh, UCM and uh, UC. So we have other findings, other interesting findings. And uh, of course, we, we will take these results into account in, uh, the, in the future, especially with the respect to the disparity in the perception of investment of time in teaching, for example, uh, than in research. And uh, this way it's differently on women and men. We will intervene, for example, on this with uh, respect to a better distribution of tasks, uh, since in Italy research is valued much more than on teaching. So we have similar, similar find to the other colleagues so I, I think so also in the future we can uh, we can uh, 
administrate, uh, maybe <laughs> not a survey, but uh, uh, but uh, interview. We think we need we need uh, effectively uh, include in the design uh, uh, more qualitative data. Monica, in the University of Coimbra, I believe the a way to do that beyond the, um, the Supera project is to integrate uh, one or two questions, not more, in the um, in the existing procedures of uh, of monitoring and the auscultation of um, of academics. I believe not more than that, but uh, we 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 are trying to integrate some of the dimensions in those uh, in those mechanisms so i believe that's uh, an option for the future mm -hmm. and that is ucm maria yeah at the ucm and i really nicole thank you very much for that those ideas because i think that this idea of of uh, having like smaller just shorter uh, um, questionnaires in a regular way i think it's great um, at the ucm it has been created uh, the observatory for gender equality so and we are working with uh, with uh, its coordinator and uh, we we think that maybe we can work towards this idea of of doing this kind of uh, you know of shorter uh, questionnaires that's really great but also and and that's something uh, related to what also barbara said for example we we confirm uh, some uh, information and some data that are already in the in the um, um, that can be already in the data management system the general data management system of the uh, university for example that we uh, found that uh, women in the, the, that last semester at the ucm they were teaching many significantly many more hours than men and uh, this is because nobody does that with the with the data uh, but of course now if we, we we say to the you know to the deans you know of the different faculties do you really want that i mean it's it's a reality i mean it's the, the women are teaching more hours than, than men. So uh, this is something uh, that probably it's like saying, okay, you should control that. You should monitor that uh, that idea. And I hope that we can we have opened this this kind of discussion and uh, this uh, data analysis uh, for this institution. And because the preparations of the new academic year have. Uh, started, I imagine, in all of your institutions. Just this morning, I was talking with somebody from a university, not from the Supera project, and she said that um, next year, next academic year, the classes will be presential and remote, so offered twice. So all lecturers have to do the classes twice, but this is not compensated. So only one, uh, it's only counted once. So I was wondering whether you already notice in the preparations of the next academic year that some work-life balance considerations are already taken into account or not? Anybody, Barbara? I don't think so, Lut. <laughs> we know the next year is uh, will be hard. We maybe more hard than this year, because uh, we know we have uh, a mix a mix method for uh, do training in presence and in virtual classroom. So I I don't know. I know I know we are really uh, we are really tired very tired and uh, uh, we need to um, uh, we need a, a, a moment uh, a period to to reflect now what uh, what can we do in your next future i think so really and uh, i think my colleagues think the same in this moment uh, we need to reflect about uh, about the situation about this moment now uh, about the change uh, all around us uh, about the the complexity uh, i don't i don't have an answer really i don't have an answer now thank you monica or maria 
I think I have already uh, responded to that mm -hmm. question, saying that, uh, as far as I know, no specific no. measure regarding uh, work-life balance was uh, was uh, put in put into place. Uh, I don't know if Virginia, who is in, in the audience, knows more than uh, about that than me. But as far as I know, and as far as I was informed, um, no specific measure was taken. Okay. So far. <laughs> Now we have a question from somebody in the audience. Um, did you consider the possibility of integrating also non-academic personnel in your surveys to assess the impact of COVID-19 on their work activity and their lives? Maria, maybe I can start with you yeah. now. Yes, I, I, um, we, we considered it, but um, it was too much complicated because it was really different. And, 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 and in our case, the survey really wanted to work in a very core uh, issues of the supra that it, it's on the academic career. So, so we had this hypothesis that the gender uh, gender roles applied to the to the to the academic tasks. Uh, so so um, we decided to to really concentrate on that. Uh, but of course uh, that's uh, that's uh, interesting and, uh, and 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 of course we will need to uh, to do that and and not not us from the supera, but probably our institutions, our universities uh, would need also to, to do that. I know that, for example, the unions and also the uh, gender equality uh, unit uh, has, uh, uh, they have done some, some kind of, of work with the uh, administrative uh, personnel also about uh, this conciliation during the pandemic. And Barbara, how about Cagliari? Mm, not currently, you not. it will uh, perhaps be more appropriate to invest more resources in uh, the rebalancing action uh, already foreseen now, because the criticalities uh, are uh, no, while what is needed is to implement the action uh, with the human and financial resources uh, already foreseen uh, for this purpose. And Monica? Um, it is an interesting uh, and relevant question, of course, because um, also administrative stuff and technical stuff is important, uh, important um, human resources in the, at the universities, but uh, we have decided in, in, uh, together in the consortium that we should, um, uh, uh, we should uh, focus only on, uh, on academics because we have limited uh, resources. And then as we have um, a specific interest in assessing time uh, allocation to, uh, to different um, scientific uh, tasks, uh, we decided to um, to focus on on academic uh, on academic staff uh, uh, staff. Uh, um, uh, it was at the same time the this period uh, maybe it was um, more challenging to to academic staff as uh, as for as they have to conduct the remote uh, um, teaching and uh, and so it was really important to see. How how academic teaching and uh, and uh, and research uh, uh, staff uh, manage um, their activities in a in a in a remote way. So we decided it was a strategic and a resource reserve fo resources focus uh, decision. I I guess. Okay, thank you very much to the speakers and also to the audience for your questions. We don't have any questions left in the chat box. So, uh, Maria, yes. Yes, if I if I may, because I think that's uh, really interesting. Uh, the the comment by Jörg. Jörg, thank you in the chat that uh, you says uh, you say that uh, I think that uh, it also shows the the importance of introducing work allocation models to monitor how these tasks are distributed. So the idea of the, of the uh, uh, academic time and, and how uh, it is distributed and how um, strongly, uh, uh, you know, gender roles are, are seem to be 
uh, uh, put there. So, so we are really creating like a very differentiated uh, um, way and, and models for allocation uh, academic time, which are completely gendered. And, and, and this, of course, it's, it's, it's very related with, not with academic production, but with the idea and the model that the, um, the, the actual academic career model of excellence says about what it is uh, said. I mean, now, and, and, and Barbara was saying, and it's not only Italy, what it is, uh, what, what, what it counts really, and what it is important in an academic career is more the research and, the, and, and publishing and not so much uh, uh, teaching. And, and, and that's, we have to, to, to we really have to, to tackle this issue from a gender point of view, because uh, we are going to, um, uh, I mean, if we do not do uh, something about this, uh, we will keep on reproducing um, very much this uh, inequality, not only reproducing, but probably uh, augmenting, right, uh, um, uh, the, uh, this uh, inequality. And it has to do that probably we need to review this academic uh, uh, model, right? Uh, the academic or the model of the academic career and the, the model for excellence. So I think that's uh, that's important, I think. And thank you so much, Jörg. I don't know if you want to, to, to say something because I jumped into your comment. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, I mean, I think as you say, I only can agree with you, you know, the importance of monitoring these the distribution of these different tasks and this is really, what your survey at the UCM shows so so strongly, you know, uh, how these really differs in in, along general lines, and I think it's also a little bit the question to what do we want to come back? So everybody is desperate to go back to normality, but we forget that this normality was already quite <laughs> uh, precarious and exhausting. So I think we should take the opportunity, as as Nicole also said, and. Um, as Barbara also said, you know, to, to take this opportunity to, to pause and really try to say, you know, to what do we want to come back? How do we imagine this uh, post pandemic world really? Now we need to go back to the, the, the previous inequalities and precariousness. I don't think so. So, yeah, I think it's really important to stop and pause. Thank you, Nicole. Are there any thoughts you would like to share still after hearing the exchanges? You're muted, Nicole. Uh, no, really, I, I very much like the, uh, York's last point in terms of where, what's really the goal? What are we achieving to, you know, maybe we're measuring something, we want to make sure things improve, but, you know, how do we want to improve it? You know, what are we aiming for? So that every time something is tracked in one way or another, that we can say, well, we're that far off and that's what we need to do. I think that's really important. Yes, thank you. Well, I believe this brings us to the end of our uh, today's event. Thank you to the speakers and thank you especially to our two invited international advisory board members for your willingness and your availability to participate today. Maria, I hand the floor again to you to have a final word as coordinator of SUPIRA. Thank you so much, Lud. Uh, just uh, saying a, a big, big thank you to uh, Jörg Müller and Nicole Hüge. Uh, they are uh, really, they are our really good uh, international advisory uh, board members. And thank you so much because they always, they always agree when we propose uh, something to, to them. And thank you because it has been really uh, interesting. Thank you very much also to all the people behind, as, as uh, uh, Nicole was saying, all the people behind uh, the three uh, universities and, 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 and I would say all the partners, uh, um, including also Yellow Window. Uh, thank you to all the Supra teams in the different uh, universities. We have been working very hard, uh, not only the super teams, but also all the other peoples, like, for example, at the UCM, as I said, the gender equality notes and probably all the gender equality hubs, uh, both in, in Calgary and in uh, and in Coimbra. And of course, thank you very, very much uh, uh, to other to our other partners uh, being here. Maxime Forest, our, our evaluator, thank you very much for being here. And of course, thank you to all of you.
uh, for being interested in this, uh, in this. And of course, we are happy to, as uh, Lutz said, to answer all your questions. And, and, and uh, of course, uh, we really encourage you to be in touch with us uh, for all this. Thank you so much. And bye-bye. <laughs>